seated. Thank you. You don't have to do that ever again. Because I know in Canada, you guys are so kind and merciful and full of love. And, uh, and I appreciate it. I don't think Shannon's here yet. Oh, there she is. Holy mackerel, on time. Sweetie, if you want to leave at any time, it's okay, because she catches me in all my exaggerations. Nobody else knows when I exaggerate, but she does. So it makes it a little hard. But I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, we're going to do things in the next three days that will be truly life-changing. And that's a promise. It's not uh, psyching yourself up. I'm not a cheerleader. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not a motivational writer. All I am is a person who was blessed to have somebody point my head into the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs, I found some amazing strategies. And then I was blessed with three mentors who mentored me in the skill sets that enabled me to apply those strategies to my business. And in doing so, I was really blessed. And, and uh, the neat thing is, is these strategies work wherever they are applied. So you can apply them to your marriage. Um, someday I'll apply them to mine and I'll have a perfect marriage. But um, you can apply them to your parenting. Uh, your kids can apply them to their passions. Wherever they're applied, they work. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna start. They say the proof is in the pudding. Okay, so I like to show my resume. Um, my first job out of college, a big success. I lasted four months. I quit right before I was gonna be fired. It was actually with a Canadian company. My first job was a management trainee for Manufacturers Life. Have you guys ever heard of Manulife? So I was a management trainee in Phoenix, Arizona, and they guess where they sent me for my first two weeks of training? Toronto. I had never been to the East Coast of America, much less the East of Toronto, and I couldn't believe how green and beautiful this city was. And I thought, wow, I'd like to live there. Then one day I was here in the winter and I realized, boy, <laughs> I'm glad I don't. But anyway, um, I was uh, a, a trainee, management trainee, and part of being a trainee, you have to get licensed in the sale of life insurance. And they want you to learn what it takes to sell life insurance so you can manage and coach and encourage the salesman that you'll be managing. So uh, I went ahead, took my test, I passed it, and I started trying to sell life insurance. Has anybody here ever been a life insurance salesman? I have so much respect for you guys. But I did, in the four months I was there, I set a record that has never been equaled by manu anybody, any salesman in manufactured life, manufacturer's life, has never equaled that, and it's probably a record for the whole life insurance policy. In the four months that I was there, I sold two policies. <laughs> and to my knowledge, nobody's ever underperformed that. But what I liked about life insurance is they said, Steve, once you sell a policy, you will get a commission for the rest of your life or the rest of your policyholder's life. So you pray for a long life for them. And uh, I thought, wow, that's cool. I make one sale and I get a lifetime income. They lied. I'll tell you how I know. Because as soon as I, lo I left my job, within a month, both of my policyholders stopped paying their, their premiums. I couldn't afford mine anymore. So I had, because I was unemployed. And the other guy that I sold a policy to was my best friend, and he was in a theological seminary in Chicago. And when he heard I was out of the life insurance business, he called me and, and he said, Steve, uh, are you okay now that you're not in the business if I quit paying my premiums? And I said, well, Lynn, I count on that every month because still, they still send me a check. And he said, uh, well, how much do they send you? I said, well, your premium's $25, and the, since it's in its first year, I get uh, 15 of that. And he said, great, I'll stop sending the check into manufacturers for 25, and I'll just send you a check for 15. Because <laughs> I'm 21 years, 22 years old, and I'm not gonna die anyway real quick. And you know what it's like to be a full-time student, you, you don't make any money. And so I said, go ahead, just cancel the policy. So he did. And, uh, but that was job number one, oops. Job number two, I start, actually started a business with two other guys and it failed 
eight months out. Job number three was my first real marketing job, and that's what I graduated in. I graduated from Arizona State University in the business school with a degree in marketing. Well, job number three was my first marketing job. I actually was hired to work in the marketing department of a large company in Philadelphia. And I was thrilled. But because of my other two jobs, it didn't last long, they hired me on probation. Has anybody ever been hired on probation? <laughs> that means they pay you a subhuman wage until they take you off probation, and then they bring you up to a normal wage. And they told me I would be on probation for six to nine months. And um, I really impressed them. My, my second day on the job, I didn't show up because my wife, not Shannon, my first wife, my, um, and Shannon, by the way, is my second wife. Uh, we've been married for 25 years. We'll just get that out in the open for those of you that didn't know. But I, I oh, thank you. Well, we have our 25th anniversary actually in 11 months. We just had our 24th. But anyway, um, so my second day on the job, I get a call that my wife, who's three hours away in Washington, D.C., has gone into labor. So the person I'm living with, I said, will you please call my boss, Mr. Rakish, and tell him that I won't be in today because my wife's having a baby. He said, oh, I'm sure he'll understand. I said, okay. So I drive as fast as I can to get down to D.C., Holy Cross Hospital on the Beltway there in, in um, can't remember the name of the town now. I'll remember it in a minute. But anyway, I run in and I said, uh, hi, where's my wife? And they said, well, what's her name? I'm a little ADD, so I forget little details a lot of times. And I said, well, her name is Bonnie Scott. And they said, well, why is she here? I said, we're having a baby. And they said, well, that's labor and delivery. You go down the hall, and then go up to the second floor and so on. So I go running down the hall, go up to the second floor and go up to the lady. And I said, hi, where's my wife? And she says, same stupid question, what's her name? And I said, her name is Bonnie. And they said, Bonnie what? I said, oh, Bonnie Scott. And they said, well, she's not here. I said, what do you mean she's not here? They said, well, she had false labor. So we didn't have cell phones back then. I said, what do you mean she had false labor? Well, you're not going to have your baby today. I said, oh, yes, we are. <laughs> I said, I'm on probation. <laughs> and she gave me a look like she should call security <laughs> and didn't realize she didn't know I meant probation at work, not, in, not, not from the state penitentiary. And she says, well, we can't do anything about that. I said, oh, well, I can. So I drove to where she was, which was about 45 minutes away. And it was, she was with a friend's house that had, lived on a big hillside that went right down to the Potomac. It was 50 acres on the Potomac. And um, I get there and I said, hey, we got to have the baby today. She said, no, it was false labor. I said, you don't understand. I'm on probation. I cannot not have this baby today. We got to have the baby. I can't go into Mr. Rakish tomorrow and say, oh, false labor. But, and then the next day, oh, I got to go. How many times are we going to have false labor? I'm on probation. So she said, well, I don't know how we're going to go into labor. I said, I do. We're going to start walking the hill. <laughs> I mean, it was like 200 yards going down this trail down to where their tennis court was, which was right on the road. And then it's 200 yards up. How many times do you have to make that, right? We did it maybe four or five times, nothing. And I'm begging and pleading. Finally, at 6 p.m., she goes into labor. How many of you ever been to Washington, D.C. and see the Beltway, the 415 that goes around the city? Anybody? Raise your hands high. You know what happens at 6 o'clock? You can't even get on it, hardly. You're in a parking lot. So I'm in a parking lot at 6 in the evening, and now I'm hearing the words from the back seat, hurry, hurry! I can't hurry. There's 400,000 cars in front of me, and they're all stopped. Well, it takes us about an hour and a half, but we finally get to the hospital. I feel like a total klutz because I've been yelled at the whole time. And uh, we get in, and labor kind of slows down. But they say it's the real thing, so at least we're going to have the baby that night. So finally, uh, at 12.40, this is before they let dads in the delivery room, 12.40, the nurse comes in, and she says, Mr. Scott, and I said, oh, is she going into delivery now? Because they told me they didn't tell me when she went into deliver delivery. 
And she said, well, just come see. So I go in, and there in the hallway on the gurney, tucked in her arms, was my first child. And these great big blue eyes looked up at me. And I felt something that I didn't even know existed before. I felt a type of love. It wasn't more of the same. It was a different kind of love than I had ever known. And I'm looking down at that baby, and I said, can I hold her? And they said, well, we, it's late. We need to get her into the nursery. I said, well, can I come? Oh, no, you're not allowed in the nursery. But we'll move her right up to the glass, and you can look at her through the glass. And I said, okay. Well, I looked at that little baby for the next hour. It's now 1.30 in the morning. And I looked at her, and I made all these promises. I told her, someday we'll have a house. Someday we'll have a swing set. I'll make sure you go to college. I will get you everything you need. And I made promise after promise. And then it's time to go get in the car. And I start that three-hour drive back to Philadelphia. And I hear this whisper in my ear, liar, liar. How are you going to give her any of that? You can't even hold a job for a year. You're not even making minimum wage right now. How are you going to provide for your daughter? Well, I showed up at work that day when I got there. I mean, I didn't even go to sleep that night, but I showed up for work dedicated to succeed. Nothing was going to stop me from succeeding. And I, for the next nine months, I was out of 3,500 people other than security. I was first in and last out. Nothing was going to keep me from succeeding. Unfortunately, as you see, it lasted nine months. I was finally called in. I thought it was the day I was going to be taken off probation. My boss, who is a marketing guru in Philadelphia, he had been head of marketing at Scott Paper, Mr. Rakish. He calls me in. He says, have a seat, which was the nicest thing he said to me that day. And uh, he said the following, Steve, you are the single greatest disappointment in my entire career. You will, now why are you laughing? That's not funny. This is a tearjerker. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, he said, you're the single greatest disappointment in my entire career. You will never succeed in marketing. You have 20 minutes to clean out your desk. I didn't know it, but he told all of the employees in the marketing department he was going to fire me after lunch. So I go to my desk, and I start unloading everything in the drawers into a grocery bag. Everybody's sneaking peeks, pretending like they don't know anything, but they keep sneaking peeks. And I'm okay until I get to the very last thing on that desk. And the last thing on that desk is a picture, five by seven, of that newborn child. And I lifted it off the desk to put it in the bag, and I thought, you did it again. You haven't been out of college two years, and you've just lost your third job. I didn't know I had six more jobs to lose in the next four years. I was getting started. It was just the beginning. And, uh, but I perfected the art of failing. The art of, the art of failing is a cool art, and the art of getting fired. I learned how to quit right before I'd get fired. <laughs> and that's really important for two reasons. Number one, it looks better on your resume. Yeah, the job was too mechanical, too boring, wasn't using my creative, so I quit. And uh, that looks a lot better than saying terminated, see? And, uh, Secondly, you get to frustrate the person who's really looking forward to firing you. Because you've literally, they're planning on firing you any day. And then when you quit on them, they have to explain to personnel why after making thousands of dollars in investment in you, they, you quit. See? And so that, that was job number three. Job number four, nine months. Not a lot better. Job number five. Job number six, started another business, business failed. Nine months in, I had two clients, one of them went bankrupt, and he was the big one. And uh, so much for that. Job number seven, four months. See, not getting a lot better. You can see there's kind of a pattern in the income. And uh, job number eight, same thing. Job number nine, now that one, look at the jump in the salary. I was so excited to actually make 18,000 a year is what it was projected to make, 1,500 a month. But I quit after four months and there was a reason. And at this time it was different. You see, right after I lost job number five, my best friend, a guy named Gary Smalley, visited me in my home. 
And I said, Gary, I don't get it. Why do I always fail? Why can't I succeed? I'm not stupid. My mom had a, a genius IQ. She was a mathematical genius. And uh, she had a photographic memory. And I got a tiny corner of her page, so I knew I wasn't stupid. I had a degree in marketing. I understood consumer psychology, but I couldn't succeed. And I wasn't lazy, first in, last out. So why am I not succeeding? And Gary said something really neat. He said, let me pray about it. Now, many years after the fact, I told his son that, one of his sons that, a couple, maybe two months ago, and Michael said, well, you know what that means when dad says that? I said, what? He says, it doesn't mean he's getting spiritual. It means he doesn't have a clue how to answer you. <laughs> I said, really? Well, I was impressed. Anyway, he came out. I was 26 at the time. And he comes back and he says this the next day. He says, how would you like to be wiser than all your bosses? And I, I, I said, yeah, right. 26 years old, how's that going to happen? He said, if you do something for two years, in two years you'll be wiser than all your bosses. In five years you'll probably be a millionaire. Which was really stupid because... I was so broke at that point, had nothing in the bank, nothing, not even in the checking account. The only reason we had breakfast that day is two single ladies in a Bible study I taught had anonymously left groceries on our doorstep. I didn't find out for 30 years who had done it. I, I ultimately found out. But that's the only reason we had grocery money. And now he tells me I can do something for two years, and in five years I'll probably be a millionaire? How many of you would believe such a statement? Be honest. How many of you would believe that? See, I didn't believe it either. And he, he was wrong. I was a millionaire in two and a half years. So it was half the time he said, just by doing the one thing he told me to do. Does anybody have a Kleenex? Oh, thanks. See, they know me here. It's not that I mind the tears, but Shannon's always embarrassed when my nose runs, which always happens when I get teary-eyed. So anyway. Um, She's real tolerant, though. It's just I know it doesn't look good. So, okay. So, anyway, where was I? Hans, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, I didn't believe it either. But then I decided to give it a shot. And I said, what do I do? He said, every day read a chapter in the book of Proverbs in the Bible for that day. So like on May 14th, you'd read chapter 14. May 31, you'd read chapter 31. He said, do that for two years with pencil and paper in hand and write down the wisdom and insights you get and begin to apply them to your work that day. Do that for two years. It'll take you through Proverbs 24 times. He said, I promise you it will change everything. Now, the only reason I believed Gary is he had gray hair and he was a lot older than me. I was 26, and he was 34. So I figured he had a lot of wisdom. Anyway, so I started doing it. I found 15 strategies that changed everything. And interestingly, I, uh, I went to high school with Steven Spielberg. We sat next to each other at every football game. He was in the band. I was in the color guard, the two places you didn't want to be in the 1960s. But our combined weight of 220 pounds meant that the only way we'd get on the football field is if he was in the band and I was in the color guard. So you figure that out. I was 100 and, let's see, he was 110, I was 118. But we're really geeks. And we didn't see each other for 18 years. One day I'm in a restaurant in Beverly Hills and Spielberg's there, and he sees me and he comes over and we start to talk. We compare notes and we found out we did the exact same things. The exact same strategies. He applied them to filmmaking. I had applied them to marketing. And for me, they brought all my dreams come, made all my dreams come true financially and business-wise. And they had made all of his dreams come true. And he said, you know what's amazing? It's not what you learn from your teachers in school that changes your life. It's what you learn from your mentors. Because he had had two mentors, and at that time I had had two mentors. And I said, yeah, but how many people have mentors like you and I? And he goes, oh, yeah, you're right about that. See, most people don't have mentors. We all have mentors to one degree or another, but we reach a point where we can't find mentors that are really skilled in the areas we want to go into. 
and that's what it took. Gary was one of my mentors. Gary got me into the book of Proverbs where I learned the strategies and then he mentored me in the skill sets. So all this is preliminary. Now there's four approaches to anything you do. Now think about your kids too, because this is just as applicable to your children as it is to you. And uh, so any project, problem, or opportunity, we always approach from one of four perspectives. Number one is a drifter. Oh, well, those are the four, but a drifter, and a drifter simply goes with the flow, okay? Whatever comes, they just go that direction. So they're moving in this way, and they find out, for example, a college kid says, I'm gonna be an engineer. He finds out his freshman year that somebody stupidly tells him, you're not good at math, you'll never do engineering. Oh, now the flow's going this way, so I'll go this way, because the flow's easier here. Just going with the flow. Now that's how most people go through life. Most people go through most areas of their life as a drifter. They do what comes naturally. That's why men are so bad in relationships. We don't have a built-in relationship manual. So naturally, we go in directions and, and wives think, God, what is he thinking? Why did he do that? Why did he say that? It's because it's, we're just doing what comes natural. And that doesn't work in a lot of areas of life, but that's how we do it. Now, I was a drifter for most of my life in most of my areas until I learned these strategies. Then in business, I went to a different step. Okay, the next one is pursuer. And as you can see, they pursue with determination, but they still don't achieve extraordinary outcomes. But they achieve, at least they achieve something. If the, if, the, if the river's going one way and it's not where they want to go, that's okay. They're going to pursue something even if it's upstream or they have to get out of the boat. An achiever, they achieve significant outcomes and occasionally extraordinary ones. Now, what's the difference between an achiever and a pursuer? An achiever has a goal-setting program. They actually set specific goals keep their eye on those goals. They don't achieve every goal, but they achieve enough goals to become an achiever. Now, 3% of the population has a goal-setting program. That 3% makes more than double the adult population that doesn't set goals. Now, I'm gonna ask you to be real honest. How many of you have a goal-setting program where you write down your goals and you put in a significant effort to achieve those goals. Be honest, don't be embarrassed. Let me see your hands. Okay, see a few of you, maybe about uh, 10%. So that's higher than the national average. The national average is 3%. So that's achievers, and a person can be all three of these at one time. They can be a drifter in a marriage and an achiever in business. They can be an achiever in a marriage and a drifter in business. Um, but th those are the four approach the three approaches. The fourth one, is a super achiever, and a super achiever regularly achieves, and that's the key word, not once in a while, but regularly achieves extraordinary outcomes. So if you achieve one extraordinary outcome one time, that's not being a super achiever, that's you did it once. A, a batter who can hit a home run one time in his life is not a home run hitter. He's gotta do it over and over and over again uh, if he's considered a home run hitter. Same thing here. Now, what's the difference? The difference between a super achiever and an achiever is a super achiever uses an entirely different set of strategies. What's a strategy? A strategy is a fancy word for how you approach something. Okay? I have a son that's a high jumper. And when he approaches, the, the, the first thing he has to get down at the beginning of every season is he has to work on his approach. He approaches from the left side. When he gets close to the bar, he starts his high torque turn. He's running full speed. Then he plants his foot, and then he leaps, okay? And then once he leaps, he has to create an arch, a C like that, not flat, but an arch, or he won't get nearly as high. So all those are part of his approach, okay? A strategy is simply how you approach something. That's all it is. And... Uh, Let's see, this is what Donald Trump said when he read my first book. It's the only book he ever endorsed that he didn't write. And um, 
So I was really excited to get the endorsement. But he said that the strategies are so specific and easily applied that I believe they can empower anyone from a college student to a small business owner, that's most of you, to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company to achieve levels of success, look at this last one, that they haven't yet dreamed of. See, right now, all of you have certain dreams. And those dreams represent the top of what you think you can achieve or want to achieve. What Trump said in his statement is you haven't even dreamed of what you're capable of, what you're truly capable of. And he said that's what these strategies can harness for the people that use them. What we're going to look at today is the key to winning every race. And uh, if you think about it, there was one guy, the United States had a miler named Steve Scott. So you, I always had to say Stephen K. When I published my first book, my publisher said, no, we're gonna, it's going to be Stephen K. Scott, not Steve Scott. I said, nobody calls me Stephen K. They all call me, except my wife. She says, calls me Stephen K. And, uh, but I said, everybody else calls me Steve. She says, yeah, but Steve Scott is the great U.S. miler, and he's written a book, so we're going to put the K there and put the N on so people know the difference. Well, Steve Scott was America. He held the U.S. record in the mile for 37 years. But more important than that one record, he broke a 40 minute mile 148 times. Yeah, wow. They say that's a record that will never be beaten in history. They can't, I mean, it's just crazy. And, um, but here, that's what we're talking. We're about talking really not about winning every race, but winning most of the things you race in. Most of the things you go after achieving most of them. Okay, then we're going to look at another strategy called the Great Accelerator. So we're going to look at those two for sure tonight, maybe some more. Uh, they work wherever they apply. They work on the job, projects, marriage, parenting, athletics, and artistic endeavors. And um, uh, they don't get applied in every area, but where they, when they are applied, they work. They're like the laws of, the physical laws that govern the universe, okay? So the law of gravity doesn't care how old you are, how young you are, how rich or how poor you are, how educated you are. The law of gravity works the same for all of us. If we drop this pointer, it will fall every single time. Okay? We're going to see the same thing in some laws of life. We're going to see that it doesn't matter who applies them. Now I'm going to show you two family videos. Those two videos are going to take a total, each one's about two and a half minutes. My wife doesn't know I'm doing this. Honey, if you want to leave the room, it's okay. She gets embarrassed when I show family videos. But there's a reason. There's a reason. So the first video you're going to show, and, and Patrick, don't play it yet, is our three sons when they're young. And our, three, our oldest son at the time, who today is in medical school, his name is Devin, and he was about 10 years old or 11 here, and he was given a class project. They were studying the history of Utah. So he was supposed to talk about Brigham Young and when Brigham Young uh, came into the Utah Valley and established Salt Lake City as the, as, the, as the home of the Mormon church. And that was in 1847. And then I'm going to tell you what happened with each of the boys. So right after the little, the little act, stop the video, Patrick. Okay. In 1847, we arrived on a, in a basin and these are two of my 5,000 followers. My brother Brigham, when are you going to stop? We have gone too far. Brother Brigham, I agree is right, Brother Brigham. Our, I agree our horse is getting, getting too tired. When are we going to stop? Soon. A matter of fact, right now, for this is the place, and we will call it Salt Lake City. Woo! Yeah! 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 Now, stop it. Okay. Now, Devin, the one who was talking, he's today a third year medical student. Uh, working on his MD at the University of Colorado. Ryan, the one who did that to his little brother, uh, we're going to see what happened with him. Now, 
before we look at what, and then we're going to see what happened with Sean. Before we look at Ryan, Ryan found out he was good in track. He was very fast. Uh, he could jump really well, long jump, high jump, and he broke his hand. Oh, that's the wrong video. We're going to look at the second half of the other video you had. And one day he breaks his hand in Little League sliding into home plate, so he has to wear a cast. So when that happens, he says, hey, Dad, now can I join the Mac Mercury Track Club? Because they had been trying to recruit him. He was only 12, and uh, he kept having to say no because other sports were competing. So with a cast, he started his track career. And that year, he went to the national championships and took third in the nation in high jump as a 12-year-old, third for 12-year-olds. Uh, he was on the side platform, loved it, it was great, but he told me as he, after he came down, you know, I'd really like to get the gold. So I like that. I said, you really want the gold? I said, okay, you can achieve the gold, you can be the best. Next year he was number four, or number five. The following year he was number four. Then thanks to a coaching error of dad, the next year he was number 20. <laughs> now does anybody see a pattern we're not going to number one. Then my wife brilliantly applied one of the strategies, which was effective partnering when she found the right coach. The coach effectively applied a number of other strategies that we'll talk about, and now we'll show you the results. Okay, go ahead and play that again. The Junior Olympic Track and Field Championship starts Sunday, and a local jumper is back on the national stage. Four years ago, you met Ryan Scott. The 12-year-old had just shattered the state age group record by six inches and finished third at the national championships. He was jumping four feet nine inches and dreaming of Olympic gold. I felt like I was up in the Olympics. Well, Junior Olympics. But like in 2016, you're ready to go? Yeah. Flash forward four years. Ryan's now 16. The hair is shorter, the voice is deeper, and he doesn't jump off the same leg, thanks to an injury. My foot would pronate and go out, and it caused this knee to get jumper's knee, which is inflammation in the knee. The constant pain and swelling forced him to suddenly switch and start jumping off his right knee, and yet improbably, he's still an elite jumper. He cleared 6'5 and finished second at the national championships. He still dreams of the big time. It's a uh, hope. Oh, I'm shooting for the Olympics. But along the way, he's learned some lessons. It's sacrifice and diligence. That's the kind of things that I get out of it. How high do you want to be jumping two years from now when you're done with high school? Two years from now? I, I don't want to say because I don't want to... Boost you don't life. want some idiot TV guy yeah. running this tape back now, do you? Exactly. So, I don't know what... Who knows? He does want to jump 6-7 at the Junior Olympics. More news in a minute. Congratulations to Skyline High School's high jump sensation, Ryan Scott. The 16-year-old just won the high jump at the National Junior Olympic Championships with a jump of 6 feet 7 inches. That's from applying the strategies without even thinking about it. My wife was so upset with me that I had given Ryan bad coaching the day of the Junior Olympics when he took 20th, when he was ranked 7th, that she went out and found the right coach. She effectively partnered. That coach in one year took Ryan from a ranking of number 20 to number 1. She did the exact same things we're going to talk about tonight. That's sports. We know it worked in business for me. <clears throat> I had another son, the one who kind of had the lisp, and turns out he's got a gift in piano. And when he was 12 and a half years old, he told his piano teacher, he had two of them, or he asked me, he said, Dad, what's, what's your favorite musical piece? And I said, Rhapsody in Blue. He said, can we go buy the music? And he doesn't even read music. And I said, yeah, we can go buy it, but 
but Sean, it's a mini concerto. It's 17 minutes long. He says, yeah, but can we buy the music? Because his instructors would work through him measure by measure. Even though he didn't know how to read music, they would tell him what notes, and he would play it and remember it. So uh, we got the music. It was 31 pages. And uh, we go to his one teacher, and she said, oh, uh, a 12-and-a-half-year-old, Sean can't learn that. It's impossible. Uh, Gershwin wrote it for his skill set. And no child could ever learn. There's a lot of crossovers and fingerings, very complex. There's no way a child could learn this. We went to his other instructor. He said, no, no child could learn this. So we did what any good dad would do. We fired the two instructors. <clears throat> and we found a 26-year-old boy who thought he could teach him. And then he's, he asked me after he saw Sean play, when, what, is there a deadline? I said, yeah, 18. Anytime before 18 is good. It's 31 pages. Well, a year and a half later, Sean sat down in front of a, in a ballroom of 600 people with a big screen TV. I think, I don't know, Mike and, and I don't, was, were any of you in that auditorium that night? Okay, you guys were. And um, he played for 600 people. I'm going to show you the last two minutes of that piece because that shows you why two instructors said it was impossible. You'll see. I've had concert pianists look at my son doing this and shake their heads. And, um, but you can see. Let's go ahead and show it. At the end, he had played 15 minutes before that. 31 pages in his head. See? Two impossible dreams. Ryan had an impossible dream of being a national champion. Sean had an impossible dream of playing Rhapsody in Blue. Teachers told Sean he couldn't do it. How did they know? How many people tell you that you can't do this or this. You're not a Donald Trump. You can't do it. You don't have the money. You don't have the education. You haven't even graduated from college. You don't have a master's degree. You don't know about business. All the things in the world. Do you know Zig Ziglar was a friend of mine? And Zig told me that by the time a child graduates from high school, they have heard the words, you can't, over 50,000 times. Who do people think they are? 
The guy who fired me and said, you will never succeed in marketing. I set every single record in television marketing that exists. 40 million phone calls. I created the model that was used by Guthrie Rinker, and they do almost $2 billion a year in sales. How could he say that? He's not God. Nobody who tells you what you can't do, they're not God. They don't have a crystal ball. They don't know what's around the corner. They don't know your heart, your mind. Shannon and I had the honor of listening to uh, the world's number one pediatric brain surgeon about a year and a half ago. And he said, you know what? He says, I get so angry at what people say to kids. You're not mathematical. You can't do this. You can't do that. He says, I tell you, I've seen 10,000 brains of children. You want to know something? They all look alike. So one thing we're going to do today is establish a new norm for you. Was Shannon okay when she left? Oh, good. I don't know if I'd said something. Okay. She might have been embarrassed. She didn't know I was going to show family videos. And, and, and I'm not bragging, I am, but I'm not. But I, I'm trying to make a point that the strategies work for anybody when applied to anything. Because what happens? People will say, well, yeah, but it won't apply to sports. People will say, well, it won't apply to, you know, artistic endeavors. Uh, my kid wants to be a movie maker. It won't apply to him. You know, maybe it applies in marketing. Maybe business. No, the strategies don't know the difference. They work wherever they're applied. Okay, the key to winning every race. That's what we're looking at first. Now, we're, we're going to look at laws of life, cause and effect principles that create or govern income, uh, outcomes, objectives. All an objective is is a specific goal, a strategy, the way you approach that goal, tactics, the specific methods and tasks that have to be accomplished to achieve a strategy, and finally, a skill set. Now, the neat thing about this, every strategy we look at this weekend, you're going to walk away with the skill sets to apply it. And once again, if you apply the skill set, if your child, it doesn't know. It doesn't know who's applying it, but, but that's what we're going to do. Now, the world's most advanced computer. Uh, I had the joy of knowing a guy. He was from India, but he headed an engineering team that in 1977 built the world's fastest computer. It could, it was a mainframe, and it could uh, receive one billion inputs a second. So he's bragging about it to me. He had got, been awarded 11 patents, and of course he turned them over to Burroughs, who, who he worked for. And he says, it, it, it can receive what, a, million, a billion inputs per second. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. How many does it receive simultaneously? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, if it receives a billion a second, is that two per at a time or 10? No, 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 it's linear, one at a time. I said, really? I said, your brain receives six million inputs simultaneously just from each eye. Or from the two eyes together, it's three million per eye. Your brain receives six million inputs just from your eye at the exact same time. The conscious area of your brain processes 2,000 transactions a second. Ready? Okay, here we go, on your mark. Get set, go. And you've just processed 10,000 transactions. Your brain. That's the conscious area of the brain. That's the part that thinks. Look at this. The limbic area, which is the subconscious area and the unconscious area, 400 billion transactions a second. And man thinks he's so smart that he can create the computers that exist today. Nothing compared to your brain. Now, my friend didn't create that computer so that the Defense Department and major banks and legal firms could add two plus two and get four. He created it so it could do phenomenal 
calculations. They could point at a plane, a, a dot on a radar screen and it would instantly tell them the direction, the speed, the wind heading, identify the plane, who it belongs to. Instantly, at the speed of light, it could do that. that that's the kind of calculation it was created for. If God gave you something that's infinitely greater than that mainframe, do you think he did it so you can have an okay life? So you can have an okay professional experience. So you can have an okay marriage. So you can be an okay parent. That's ridiculous. You have the world's most advanced computer so you can achieve extraordinary outcomes in the areas of life that are important. The areas of life that aren't important, who cares? But there's some things that are really important. That's already what I said. So, okay, software for your brain. Let's see where this has taken us. You've been programmed for mediocrity. We were programmed from the time we were little. We've been taught by our teachers, your experience, what you adopt as your norms, limitations created by your fears, limitations created by your failures, and limitations created by your perceptions. All of that programs us for mediocrity, okay? How many of you, has anybody here been told what I was told in high school, you don't have a mathematical brain? Can you raise your hands? How do they know? Because you didn't solve a problem, how do they know it wasn't that you were poorly taught? Huh? No, it's crazy. Okay, your experience. We, this is the biggest programming of all. I learned real young when I was in my first Little League baseball team. I learned that when I swung and missed for the third strike, especially if it was the last out, my teammates would throw their hats down, their bats down, the coach would usually yell something at me, and uh, the parents would go, ugh. But I learned nobody did that if I walked. In fact, the coach used to tell me every time I'd come up to the plate, hey Scott, remember a walk is as good as a hit. No, it's not. It gets you to first base, but it doesn't feel good. It's not satisfying. It doesn't drive in any runs. A walk's not as good as a hit. But I also hated how I felt when I struck out. So there I'd stand, and I'm depending on the pitcher to throw four balls before he throws three strikes. And, I, and what happened? My fear of failure of impacted my behavior. And then one of the coaches said, forget what the other coach says. Just keep your eye on the ball. You don't even have to swing hard, just meet it. And I started hitting, and I stopped striking out. I wasn't a power hitter, but I got on base more than anybody else on the team. That coach was the assistant coach. It was my dad because he cared about his son more than he cared about the team winning a game. He had a good dad. Okay, how many of you, my mom had a photographic memory, okay? Uh, she could, she could uh, read a magazine and she could quote you line and verse, page number, anything in the magazine once she read it. She was amazing that way. How many of you have a photographic memory Okay, now maybe I better define it in case some of you fearlessly raise your hand. How many of you, without trying and without writing anything down, so I don't want you to write anything down and I don't want you to try, how many looking at that list in under two minutes, you can't try to memorize it and you can't write it down, how many of you can memorize it? You can't write it down and you can't try to memorize it. Anybody? So you think that you don't have a photographic memory. Because my mom could have looked at that list, I could have taken it away that fast. She couldn't forget it if you put a gun to her head. Okay, that's a real photographic memory. And every single one of you right now could pass a lie detector test administered by the FBI uh, swearing that you don't have a photographic memory and that you cannot memorize a list of 15 unrelated objects in two or three minutes. Right? You think you could pass that lie detector test? Yeah. 
Okay, now I want you to do something. Have I ever done this with you guys? Good, okay. Okay, I'm gonna go down here. It's on the other side, and we hear it. And all of a sudden, out from that wall comes a big yellow fish. And that big yellow fish is floating all around the room, and he opens his mouth, and out comes a bubble. And inside that giant bubble is Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton is waving at you. Hey, I'm glad to be here in Canada. And he reaches into his pockets, and he pulls out some marbles, red marbles, and he drops them on the floor. They go into a shape of a star. You go, whoa, cool, a star. And inside the star is a Walmart. And you think, Walmart, man, everyday low prices. I'm going to go in there. So you go into the Walmart, and on every single shelf, everywhere you look, Fritos. Nothing but bags of Fritos. Everywhere. So you think, okay, I'm kind of hungry. So you grab a bag of Fritos, you open it up, and inside the bag is broccoli. (laughs) You think, well, I'm with Max. I want to start eating healthy anyway. So you pull out the broccoli, and you bite it. And out of the broccoli comes all of this chocolate. And the chocolate gets all over your blue sport coat. So you grab a newspaper off of the rack, and you start to rub it, and it doesn't come off, so you pour a Coca-Cola onto the newspaper, and you rub it, and it changes your blue sport coat into a red shirt. And you go, oh my gosh, a red shirt. And down at the other end of the Walmart aisle is a bull, big horns. (laughs) And he sees that red shirt, and he points his head, And you think, "Uh uh-oh, he thinks I'm lunch. And uh, then he stands up on his tiptoes, reaches up onto the top rack, and pulls down a toy guitar and starts to strum it. Now, what comes through the wall? What comes out of the fish's mouth? Who's in the bubble? What comes out of his pocket? Goes into what shape? What's inside the star? What's on every shelf in Walmart? You open the bag, and what's in the bag? You bite the broccoli, what comes out? Gets all over your? No? Blue sport coat. You grab a? You rub, nothing happens. You pour a? Rub it some more, what happens? Red shirt, what's at the end of the aisle? Bull, what does he grab from the top shelf? Toy guitar. Okay, in two minutes, you have remembered 15 unrelated words. You promised you couldn't do it. You passed a lie detector test saying you couldn't do it. And I'm ADD and I've lost the pointer. Who the hell? Oh, here we go. So what happened? What happened? Oops. What happened was you changed your strategy. You see, when I, th- when I say memorize, you think Red Bull, Red Bull, Red Bull. Okay, Bull, 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 Toy Guitar, Marbles. Okay, Bill Clinton, uh, Bubble, 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 Bubble. Okay, Fish, Fish. Oh, but that's the wrong order. Ooh. And so what's happening is you're using the left side of your brain, which is the analytical side, to try and do what you've always done for memory. And you've tried to memorize a list, and you can't do it. All we did is change the strategy. We said instead of using the left side of the brain, let's use the right side of the brain. And the right side is the visual side, right? And how many of you can remember a face easier than you can remember a name? Yeah, that's the visual side. You can remember stories and events going clear back to your childhood. See, that's the right side. That's the powerful side. So all we've done is we came up with an effective strategy Let's use the right side of the brain instead of the left side. And a good tactic, which was to visualize the words in a story. And out of that, you had a level of success you haven't had before. Okay, now I've got to ask Mike, because some of this stuff I'm going to go through kind of fast, and the most important, I'll slow down. Mike, how much time before break? Anybody? Mike? Five hours. Five hours. (laughs) We're going to be out of here by 1 a.m. at the latest. Okay. Two tops. Okay, well, I'll keep going until I see them. Okay, so let's give you an example of how this works. Law of life, harmony in marriage is always more enjoyable than conflict, right? That's a law of life. Does anybody here enjoy the conflict more than the harmony? No. Okay, so that's a law of life. 
Uh, here's another one. Honoring and valuing my wife, her opinions and desires creates harmony while dishonoring, devaluing, or ignoring her, her opinions or desires creates strife. Is that true? Yeah, 100 times out of 100 times. So it's a, it, it's a law. Okay, objective, make my wife feel valued. She's not in here, is she? Okay, good. Um, it's just going to say, honey, listen to your teaching, uh, and rightfully so. Objective, make my wife feel valued and honored every day. Is that a good objective? Yeah. It, what's going to happen? It'll bring the harmony, and the harmony is more enjoyment than the c conflict. Strategy, say things and do things daily that show that I honor and value Shannon, her opinions and desires, and do not do the things that dishonor or devalue her. Okay? Tactics. Well, here's what I have to do. I have to discover what I currently do that, in her opinion, devalues her. Why do I want to know that? So I don't do it. See, it's not built into us. Ladies, you think we're mean? We're just stupid. We don't know the things that you know about relationships. <laughs> Discover the things that I can begin to do that in her opinion will show her honor. Make the discoveries by setting aside time to talk with her with pencil and paper in hand and record the insights and wisdom that she gives me. Make a checklist of the do's and don'ts and begin to use, those, use that list every day to make sure that I achieve my objective, okay? So there you have examples of laws of life, an objective, a strategy, and then the tactics. Let's see, there we go. Now there is one transformational activity that combines the laws of living, objectives, and strategies, tactics, and skill sets. So it does all of that that will accomplish extraordinary outcomes when it is utilized. So that's gonna be a pretty important one, okay? And, uh, in fact, you heard my son refer to it when he was talking to the reporter. You didn't see him because you see him going over the bar at the time, but he used this key word. It is the key to winning every race. Solomon said, do you see a man diligent in his business? He will stand, not bow, he will stand before kings. What does that mean? It means he's an advisor to the king. He's a consultant to the king. That's how valuable diligence makes you. And it's also how rare true diligence is. You see, diligence, as you're about to find out, isn't just about hard work. Hard work is hard work. It's not diligence. Okay? So we're going to break that down. Here we go. Well, first we'll look at the rewards. Rewards of diligence. These are the promised rewards in the book of Proverbs. I take Proverbs seriously. Why? Because it changed my life because I've seen the principles of Proverbs perform now. I learned this in 1975. So that's almost how many years ago? Uh, 40 years ago? 40. Yeah, 40 years ago. So I've had 40 years of experience with this. Here's what Proverbs says. Number one, it'll give you a sure advantage. Now that's, in the Hebrew, that word sure is really cool. It means solid, unbreakable. You see, that stage, if we put maybe 10,000 pounds of pressure in a small area, it would break through that stage. But on that concrete, it'd make just a little tiny indentation. What's the difference? It's sure. It's rock solid, literally. Well, that's the kind of advantage that diligence brings. It puts you in control of the situation. How many of you have felt out of control sometime in the last two weeks about something and joined my club? Okay, yeah. And being out of control isn't fun. In fact, if you've ever been in a car wreck and you see it coming, you hear somebody slam on a brakes or you're in a car and somebody says, okay, hold on. Man, you're, you know you're not in control. If you've ever been on the ice, I've done 360s on the ice and, and flown off the road. You're not in control and it's no fun to not be in control. Well, diligence puts you in control. It, uh, Solomon said you'll find true fulfillment, fulfillment that lasts. Fulfillment that isn't based on your circumstances. I mean, circumstances are like a roller coaster. One moment you're high, the next moment you're on the bottom. Who wants that to control your life? Well, 
He says you'll have true fulfillment. You'll gain the respect and admiration of those in authority. You'll have ever-increasing success. I love that one. Your success is not going to be permanently plateaued. Okay? So you may hit a plateau occasionally, but it's not going to stay there. It's going to be on an ever-increasing line when you're diligent. Your needs will be satisfied. Your efforts will be profitable. And here's the consequences of not being diligent. You'll be at an insurmountable disadvantage, no fun. You'll be ruled, in other words, out of control. You'll lack understanding. Why is this happening to me? I don't understand it. Welcome to not being diligent. Your security and wealth will ultimately evaporate. All these are stated in Proverbs, and your efforts will come to nothing. How many of you like working your butt off for months, weeks, whatever, only to find out project's been canceled, you lost money, Whatever. Okay, diligence. What is true diligence? This is critical that you know the real definition. Like I said, it's not hard work. It starts, it's, number one, it's a learnable skill. Aren't we glad? Most people think you're born with it. You're not. It's a learnable skill. That means anybody can learn it. Of effective partnering. Now, you don't have to be diligent in everything. I took up skiing so I could have romantic experiences with my wife, whom I was dating at the time. She was a real skilled skier, so I secretly took lessons and everything um, so I wouldn't look like a klutz. And here, the first time we ski together, I go down a bunny hill, and I'm so excited that I didn't fall. And here she's singing, ah, she's on a bunny hill. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, you know, oh, brother. Anyway, if you don't, you don't have to be diligent in everything, but if you really want something, a great marriage, a son that wins the national championship, a son that can play Rhapsody in Blue, a wife that admires and respects you, a husband that honors you and values you, wherever you want to apply it. If you don't effectively partner, you're not diligent. That eliminates most of us from being diligent in most areas. But we don't have to be diligent in most areas, just in the areas that are most important to us. Okay, so it takes effective partnering. Now, for example, a partner can be an author. So if you want, I partner with Gary Smalley in my marriage relationship. I used to call him all the time. Gary, what do I do in this? How, how, I really blew it with Shannon today. Well, how do I fix it, you know? And Gary would give me great advice. Well, you can partner with Gary Smalley just by buying one of his books. You don't have the right to call him but you have the right to buy a book and hear the same stuff that Steve Scott heard. So if you hear wisdom from a source, whether it's a live body or a, a good author who's accomplished what you want to accomplish, don't pay attention to theorists. You don't want to partner with somebody who has a lot of theory. You want to partner with partners who have accomplished what you want to accomplish. So it's a learnable skill that combines elective, uh, effective partnering, creative persistence, we'll talk about that later, it's not just hitting the wall, falling down, getting up, hitting it again and again and again. That's stupidity. That's not persistence. We're going to look at creative persistence, which is what Thomas Edison did to creatively persist through more failures to achieve more successes than anybody else in history. With a smart working effort. What's a smart working effort? If I took Mike and Chris and brought them up here, or not here, we'll say we're out in the forest, and there's two giant trees, okay? There's a tree this thick. And I say, okay, your job is to cut down that tree as fast as you can. The winner wins $100,000. And I give Mike a nice chainsaw, and I give Chris a sledgehammer. Who's going to work harder? Right, Chris with the sledgehammer. Who's going to work longer? Yeah, Chris will take years. Okay. But does it mean he was smart? No, he would have said, hey, this isn't right. Give me one of those. I can't compete with a chainsaw, see? So a smart working effort isn't the hardest working effort. It's a smart, smart working effort. Rightly planned. Rightly planned. If there's no planning, you're not diligent. Like I said, you don't have to be diligent in everything. Ryan all of a sudden had a high jump coach that planned out his entire season his strength and conditioning, his endurance, his technique, all of that, his approach, his arch, his flexibility, 
All of that became part of an, a plan with the goal of peaking at the Junior Olympics, which is the biggest in the last meet of the year. Don't peak four weeks before that, and do you understand? Yes. So he did everything she said. Took second at the national championships four weeks before the Junior Olympics. You say, oh, poor Ryan. No. She didn't want him to peak that. That's a much smaller meet, the outdoors. The bigger meet is Junior Olympics. That's where she wanted him to peak. He jumps two inches higher than he'd ever jumped. In the pouring rain, every step a splash, because she rightly planned and then rightly performed in a manner that is timely. Why? Timely is critical. Why? Because we don't have enough of it. It's the one resource we can't duplicate. We can't add hours to a day. And once a day's gone, it's gone forever. So time is our single most valuable asset, and most people treat it like it's toilet water. Really. Efficient, what's efficient mean? Well, that's the difference between using a chainsaw and a hammer. Chainsaw is a lot more efficient. You get efficient just means you get more done in the same amount of time. And effective, attaining a result that is pure, and I love that word, and of the highest quality of excellence. When people watched Ryan jump at the Junior Olympics, there were better jumpers there that he beat. In fact, one guy is now the number two U.S. decathlete, and will go to the Olympics probably this year. And, and uh, they became good buds. But Ryan beat him that day. The guy had beaten Ryan four weeks earlier. And, uh, but that, that purity of doing it right, that is what diligence is up. When any of those are missing, you're not diligent. You may be hardworking, you may be smart, you may be all sorts, but you're not diligent. And diligence is what we want. Now, what prevents diligence is laziness. We all have it. Four causes and it's part of our human nature, okay? So there's four root causes to laziness. Number one is self-centeredness. We simply are selfish. So it's fun to be lazy. Nothing beats kicking back and relaxing. And we need a certain amount of relaxation. There's nothing wrong with relaxation. But laziness causes us to, and self-centeredness is the cause, causes us to not do some things that we should do. And uh, the second one, is arrogance. We think we're better than the rest of the world, so we don't need to work as hard. Uh, irresponsibility. I don't realize how many people are counting on me. For those of you that are involved in Max, this is a big one. Do you realize there are people right now that are giving up on life? They think this is as good as it's going to get. My doctor told me it's only going to get worse from here, and they believe that. And if you don't do your part, then you're not going to reach somebody who reaches somebody who reaches that person. And they're going to go out on life thinking this is as good as it's going to get. Shannon and I had a, a couple of bad experiences in this last month. We heard about a dear friend of ours whose brother at 45 dropped over from a heart attack. At 45, four kids, see? Never got the message to him that raising glutathione can have an amazing impact on cardiovascular health. He never heard that message. Somebody failed because I didn't push it with his brother. We didn't even know his brother. I didn't. I think Shannon's met him. Then we heard this week that the same guy, the brother, not the one that died of the heart attack, his wife's dad killed himself with a gun. Why? He had a medical condition. They had, he had left the hospital prematurely in a lot of pain, couldn't take it anymore, and killed himself. People's lives are impacted when we do the right thing, and even though we don't know it, they're impacted even worse when we don't do the right thing. So we want to be responsible. And then we're lazy out of ignorance. We don't realize the consequences of me wasting an hour here or an hour there, the consequences of me not sharing something that is important to somebody. I had an employee whose son committed suicide. And uh, there were some warning signs. 
and maybe I could have made a difference, but I didn't, out of ignorance. Okay, now we can overcome all of this. We can overcome laziness and become diligent with a certain strategy and skill set. So the first okay, thing. vision mapping. You don't do it on everything because then you do nothing else because it takes some time. But where does it start? It starts with a clear and precise vision. Solomon said, without a vision, the people perish. When you don't have a vision, you're in the dying process. If you don't have a vision for your job at work, then you begin to lose your love for that job. You begin to not like it at all, and, and literally you're in the dying process. Everybody comes into a marriage with a vision. Women come in with a vision of certain needs being met, and men come in with certain needs being met. A woman has four great needs, a man has three great needs. Both of them, without even thinking about it, think that those needs are gonna be fulfilled by the other person. They're usually not. The marriage begins, to, they lose their vision, and the relationship begins to inwardly die. And we're going to, we can give you a solution for that a little later, because Solomon gives us a great solution. So vision mapping starts with a clear and precise de uh, description of a dream, vision, or project. And I told you I'm ADD, and now I'm thinking about that phone. And, um, <laughs> but I'll get back on track. OK. It's not enough to say I want to be rich. It's not enough to say I want to be financially independent. That's a wish. Okay, wishes are like clouds in the sky. They start on one side of the sky and they go to the other side and they're gone pretty quick. We're not talking about wishes. You have to clarify. If you're in the max business and you're a bronze, a clear and precise vision might be to become a silver. Okay? And so... You've got to write it down. Now, Edison did this on every single project. People say, do I have to write it down? Tom, how many would say Thomas Edison was pretty smart? Yeah. Engineers and chemists had been working for 50 years to create an incandescent light bulb. 50 years. And they hadn't done it. Edison gave himself three years. He wasn't an engineer, and his staff wasn't, didn't consist of the world's best, I mean, he could barely afford his staff. He had what he could pay for. He had a good one, but he, three years to do what the, what the rest of the world couldn't do in 50, see? But every single project, he received over a 1,000 patents, every single project, he started with this. He'd write down a clear and precise vision. So in this case, he wrote down on one page in his journal, a practical, affordable, long-lasting, incandescent light bulb. And he drew a little picture of what he thought it could look like. Why, because is that what it's going to look like? No, he wants to activate the right side of the brain. So part of this clear and precise vision, go ahead, even if you're drawing a stick figure, if it's a stick figure of a husband and wife holding hands to represent a happy marriage, if that's your goal, then Go ahead and draw a little thing by it, just to give you, to stimulate that part of the brain. Clear and precise description, that's where it starts. Then you list the goals that have to be achieved to do that. Now I love network marketing because network marketing, it has real clear cut and a max is like that. It says you need so much volume on this side, so much volume, total volume. It says you need, you know, Two personal recruits over here, two, re I mean, it gives you specific things. That's good, see, so that becomes your goal. You list your goals that have to be achieved. Then you break each goal into specific steps. If I need to recruit 10 associates, we'll say, in fact, we'll say if I need to recruit two associates, I know I'm gonna have to talk to at least 10 people for each one of those, so I'm gonna to have to talk to 20 people. So I list that as a step. I've gotta to talk to 20 people to achieve that goal. Now, we break the steps into specific tasks. Okay, that means I have to allow so many hours a day to phone calling. I have to get their phone numbers. I have to find out convenient time to call them. See, so those are all tasks. And then what we do at the end of the experience, oops, I don't know if I got it there or not. Nope. 
then we go ahead and we put a date. Now there's two ways to date this on a vision map. If you have a deadline, like oftentimes, that's how I tend to work. So my publisher gives me a deadline for writing a book. When I used to produce television shows and television commercials, I knew we had an air date that we had to hit. So I would work backward. I'd say, okay, if I've got to be on the air on December 26th, and it, I have to have it cleared legally, and that takes two weeks. So that means by December 12th, I have to have it completely finished to the attorneys. That means I have to have it edited by December 10th. That means I have to have it produced before I edit. I have to have it all shot by December 3rd. That means I have to have it written by such and such a date. So I've got all my steps. I, I know exactly what tasks have been claiming. So that's working from a deadline. If you don't have a deadline, then you work the other way. Okay, how long is it gonna take me to make 10 phone calls? Well, figure I'm gonna do three a day because I work hard during the day, I'll get home at night or I'll do a weekend, so I'll do three a day. So I can do 10 by Friday. Friday gets assigned to that. See what I'm saying? And then you work toward the end. So you can work, if you're on a deadline, you're starting with the end in mind and putting the dates to hit that deadline. If you don't have a deadline, then you look at realistically what you're gonna commit to. So if you're gonna commit to three a day, okay, then it's gonna take me three days, four days to hit that 10th person. So that becomes my deadline for that particular task. Do you see how it works? So at the end of the day, you not only know specifically where you're going, but you've got a detailed map and schedule to get there. Now, if you've ever taken a driving vacation, not a flying vacation, but where you haven't actually drove on the vacation, raise your hand. Okay, can you imagine somebody says, hey, where are you going on vacation this week? Because they, they know you're taking the time off. Well, I'm going to the West Coast. The West Coast? That doesn't, where on the West Coast? Oh, I'm going to BC. Well, that narrows it down. We're in BC. You're not gonna get there. When are you gonna get there? Oh, I don't know, we're just gonna point the car and hope we get there. See, nobody does a vacation, and a vacation's just a vacation, it's not your life. What do you do? Well, we're gonna be, um, we're gonna go to Vancouver, then after Vancouver, we're gonna come back. We're gonna to go to uh, Lake Banff, or is it Banff, and then Lake Victoria. We're gonna see all these things, and I, to, in order to do that, I have to be there by such and such a date, and to do that, on the first day, I've gotta drive from here to here. Second day, I've gotta drive from here to here. Third day, we'll hit here, okay? You're, that's how you approach a vacation. Well, that's how you need to approach anything important. You need to go ahead and establish the timeline that goes with it. Now, what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this isn't an exercise. The purpose of this is a destination and the most effective and enjoyable journey to reach that destination. Most people don't go through life. I'm describing what? A super achiever. I'm not describing a drifter. A drifter just goes wherever life takes them. You can be a drifter in a lot of areas of your life. I was a drifter in skiing once I learned how to ski. Because I knew I didn't want a competitive ski, I just wanted to go down the hills and ride the chairlift with this good looking blonde. And uh, that was pretty easy to achieve. I, I did hurt myself a few times, but it wasn't bad. Okay, now, let's take a break right now because when we come back, we're gonna talk about a different type of goal setting. Something that's completely different than what the world teaches you. So, and then we'll go from there. So now we're gonna talk about goal setting. Now it's, what the world teaches you, how many of you have heard the saying, set achievable, reachable goals? Has anybody ever heard that? That's taught by Franklin Covey, it's taught by just about every motivational speaker. That's true if you want normal to a little bit above normal outcomes. Now, in most areas of life, that's okay. But 
When you want extraordinary outcomes, that's the wrong way to set goals in that area. You want to, instead, we teach shooting for the moon, which is setting up, they were supposed to come on one at a time, uh, setting impossible goals. And people say, well, if it's impossible, then how can I achieve it? And that's foolishness to set impossible goals if you can't achieve it. Well, no, because, let's see if I get into it here. Okay, no, I don't. Um, when you shoot for the moon or set impossible goals, they're impossible for you by yourself. But if you shoot for the moon and set impossible goals, what it does, it forces you to reach outside of yourself and effectively partner. So the key to hitting the moon when you shoot for it is who you partner with. And we're going to get into that in a second. Um, well, in fact, let's get into it right now. <clears throat> so I call it the great accelerator. It gives you maximum achievement. Effective partnering gives you maximum achievement in minimum time. It's contrary to our nature and what we've been taught. We've been taught to be, quote, self-sufficient. You know, watch your own back. Uh, how many of you have had a course in high school or college or graduate school in effective partnering? Yeah. See, nobody. And you want to know something? Larry King, when he had me on his show the first time, uh, he said, before the show, he said, what's, what's the most important of the strategies? Which one's the most important? I said, Larry, they're all important. He says, no, 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 come on, kid. They, one of them's got to be more important. I said, no, one, none of them are more important. But one is the most powerful. Well, that's what I mean. You know, powerful, important, what's the difference? Well, there's a huge difference, okay? Importance is how you swing the bat. Power is what puts it over the fence. And so what we want is what's powerful and what's the most powerful strategy of the 15 strategies that I, I learned is effective partnering. It's contrary to our nature. And so it doesn't come naturally. Our nature is just to try to do everything by ourselves, And um, you can't do it. You can only achieve mediocrity by yourself. And I've had people that have been deceived or arrogant and say, I've met guys who are what they would call, they would say, I'm a self-made billionaire. And then I ask them, who changed your diapers? I haven't met one billionaire that changed his own diapers when he was a baby. Uh, who fed you for the first six months of your life? I haven't met one that fed himself. Uh, who taught you how to read? I haven't met any that taught themselves to read. You see, they haven't self achieved it all by themselves. They've been partnering their whole life. They just don't know it. And who you partner with, uh, ineffective partnering, accelerates failure. Now, most partnerships are ineffective by nature. They're ineffective for a whole bunch of reasons. Self-centeredness, you get two partners, they're both self-centered. They each want their own goals, they're not united in their goals. If one has a character flaw or has a problem with integrity, then that sinks the partnership. All sorts of things. In fact, Solomon gives seven red flags to look for when you're partnering with somebody. And you, if you see any of those seven red flags, he tells you to run away. I don't think we're getting into it right now. It's in my book um, called uh, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived. And it's available online. You can get it from Amazon.Canada or whatever. And, or uh, just from my own assistant. Uh, if you need to reach her, then Mike or anybody can tell you how to reach her. And you can order books from my website, which is StephenKScott.com. But Amazon.Canada is probably the best way because it comes, it's, comes from Canada, in Canada, so I do that. But effective partnering uh, is not natural. Ineffective partnering is. Probably at least 80 to 90% of all partnerships fail. That's ineffective partnering. We want to effectively partner. So let's look at what the elements are. The first thing you have to do is identify the need. I don't need to partner in everything. But once again, the important things. My son, Ryan, the high jumper, needed to find the right coach. 
And my wife, in, a, in true inspiration, called the head coach for Brigham Young University, where she graduated, and she said, my son needs a good coach, who would you recommend? And he recommended two, two different coaches. A, a college coach cannot coach a high school athlete. That's against NCAA rules. But he said, we've got two people that are extraordinary high, that are extraordinary high jump coaches, and if he could get either one of those, they'd be good. And you know what Shannon said? And I love this. Which one's the best? Is that a smart question? Yeah. Why? Because it's our child. He really wants this goal. Why not get him the best? You know the difference between a best coach and a mediocre coach? Probably an extra 10 or $15 an hour. Come on. Can you think, how about when my son, my son had two piano teachers that uh, were good teachers. One had been a professor, and, um, but they weren't the right, right coach for my son. They weren't the right piano teachers. They were right up to a certain point, but when he wanted to do the impossible, their mind couldn't get out of the box. Can you imagine if either of my children hadn't achieved those goals? Do you know what? It was like for my son, after he sacrificed for an entire year, there were parties he didn't go to at school in the summertime, which is the, the track season. He didn't get to go to any of the high school stuff. He gave up all of that, working out two hours to three hours a day, usually two hours. I don't want to exaggerate. Shannon's not here yet, so I can still exaggerate. And, um, but giving up all of that, how sad if he had just stayed at number five or six or seven when his goal was to, to be national champion. And do you know, winning that one championship changed everything. It got him a college scholarship. It uh, changed his own self-image. The big TV stations, NBC and CBS in, our, in Salt Lake, both did big interviews with him. Uh, the newspaper did a big write-up on him, because he did it. What you didn't hear is he did it on his injured, he had injured his jumping leg. He switched sides, which no high jumper had ever done, and he jumped off his weaker leg. And he won this national championship on the weak leg. So that was a big part of the story that we didn't talk about. But the point is, how sad if I had believed the first two piano teachers. How sad if I had kept Ryan with the coach he had, which was a good coach. It, that guy was a, took fourth in the NCAA in long jump. And he knew about high jump, but he wasn't a high jumper. When Shannon said the best coach, he said, well, we, if you really want the best, she's a little more expensive and she only coaches here in Provo, so you'd have to drive him to Provo every week. And she said, that's okay, we'll figure it out. And he said, well, she's a three-time Olympian, two-time Olympic high jumper, one-time Olympic volleyball player. And he said, she's very, very strict. Whoa, you have no idea. She tells Ryan all these rules. And if you break this rule, and if you don't do this, and you'll have to give, you're gonna to have to give up football. And the whole sophomore team was building their whole offense around Ryan because he was so strong and fast. And uh, she, you don't have to answer now. If you don't give it up, I'll come cheer for you at the track meets, but I will not be your coach because football will create this kind of energy and this kind of training and so on. And uh, he says, coach, football's for fun, this is my sport. She says, and then of course you have to give up all the other basketball, and this guy could dunk backwards. I mean, he, was, he got, had such a vertical leap, it was crazy. And, uh, and then you have to give up skiing. Well, that was the one that hurt, because he loves to snow ski. He can do acrobatics, you know, the spinning, stuff like that. But he wanted, he wanted that national championship, so he had to pay all this price. There's a price for diligence. There is sacrifice. But at the end of that season, they went back to school, and in September, they go back to school, and what's the first thing kids do? They talk about their summers. He said, Dad, he came home after the first day of school, Dad, I heard what everybody did this summer. He said, they talked about the parties, they talked about this. He says, but you know what? None of them has a championship. He said, I didn't do, get to do what they did, but I've got something that I've got for the rest of my life, a national championship. See, it all pays off.
But diligence requires sacrifice. Okay, he effectively partnered. So did Sean with that boy who watched him play a little Mozart sonata and looked at me and said, he can play Rhapsody in Blue. Wow. Your two guys say it's impossible? And this guy says he can do it. You know, and there we go. Okay, identify, first you've got to identify the need. Now that's critical. Tomorrow we're going to take a personality test. It's the one test you'll take in your life that you can't flunk. Everybody here has a personality, okay? So that's good, and it's gonna identify what your dominant personality type is, and then we're gonna talk about strengths, because each personality type has a set of wonderful strengths, but each personality type has a set of terrible weaknesses. And we wanna know that, why? So we can play to our strengths, strengthen our weaknesses, but most important, we can partner with other personality types who have the strengths that we don't have, and therefore our weaknesses no longer limit us. So tomorrow is key to what we're gonna be doing when we do the personality test. It's only five minutes, it's a fun test, and you're gonna learn things about yourself you didn't know. And you're gonna learn things about your spouse and other team members on Max that are part of your, you're gonna go, oh, that's why they look at me goofy when I say this, because they're a lion or a golden retriever, a beaver. There's only four, lion, beaver, otter, and golden retriever. Okay, next, once you've identified the need, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, my job in television production, I am a writer and a director. I get a vision for the project, I write it, and I direct it. I'm not a producer, what's the difference? The producer has to make sure the set is right, the wardrobe's right, the casting is right, other than your, your main cast. I always picked the celebrity and got the celebrity, and, uh, but my producer would do everything else. Uh, the location work, working with location scouts, working with all these different casting agencies and so on. And our shows looked great. They performed well as far as the response from the consumers because of what I did, but they all looked great because of what Frank did. Because his personality type pays attention to detail, mine could care less about detail, I just want to get it done quick and get it done good. But it doesn't have to be perfect. Frank, on the other hand, you'll see his personality type tomorrow, he has to do it perfect. So we ended up with shows that not only performed well, but they looked so good, we got the biggest names in Hollywood that had said they'd never do a commercial. I did the only commercial that Charlton Heston ever did. I did the only commercial that Tom Selleck ever did, that James Arness, Matt Dillon from Gunsmoke, for those of you that are older, ever did. The only commercial that Cher ever did. We got celebrities that wouldn't do commercials for anything else, why? Because our shows looked so good. That played a big part in it, it wasn't the only thing but our shows had to look great to get the celebrities. Well, that wasn't Steve Scott, that was Frank Kovacs. See, so that's effective partnering. <clears throat> After you identify the need, and I knew I had a need, I'm not a, I needed a producer that could really pay attention to detail. Identify the potential partners to meet that need. So you have to create a list, and you're gonna go after that list, let's see. <clears throat> then, you have to recruit the right partners, and that's a skill set. It's just not saying, hey, I want to partner with you. So, I don't want to partner with you. Yeah, but you could really make my business go, I could be a diamond if you partner with me. So, see, there's a skill set to recruiting the right partners, and we're gonna look at that. If we don't do it today, we look at it tomorrow. I think we look at it today. And the fourth part of effective partnering, and this is where most partnerships that make it this far, then they fail here. Effectively utilize and motivate the partner that you're with. If you don't effectively, if you've got the, if I had the best producer on earth, but I micromanaged him or contradicted every decision he made, would that be effective utilization? No, I'd lose his talent, I'd lose his skill set, I'd lose the benefit of the partnership. And that, that's what companies do. So often, I, my, I, Shannon and I have, my, one of my dearest friends in life since college is a brilliant financial analyst. 
So he gets courted and recruited by a, a financial management company, and they spend a lot of time and effort to recruit him. They get him on the team. He does a radio show in Phoenix, Arizona. They get him. He's now on their team. And he's brilliant at analyzing world events. He looks like about 30 different things before he makes an investment, and he, he puts it all together. So he starts making investment suggestions for their client, and they disagree on almost every one. So they might as well not even have him on board. He meant nothing to their clients. Now, he had his own clients. And before the crash of 1987, he had me out of the market two weeks in advance. So I was fine. All of their clients got burned. Here they had this guy that saw it coming, and they didn't think it was coming. Why hire somebody that's really good if you're not going to utilize them, motivate them? How about if you motivate with the wrong type of motivation? As you'll learn tomorrow, we're going to have a little session on leadership. And there are two styles for leading. One gets short-term results fast, but destroys relationships. The other take, gets results, takes more time to get it, but creates lasting, strong relationships. And do you know most leaders lead with the negative one, the one that destroys relationships? Most parents parent that way. It's terrible. So we'll look at that tomorrow. And um, that's in the motive. Okay, identify the need. <clears throat> Here's what you have to do. First, you have to assess your own strengths and weaknesses. Okay? Now, men, for those of you that are married, this is really cool because you have blind spots and there's a lot of weaknesses that you have that you don't know about it. Guess what? Your wife has memorized every one of them. <laughs> she, can, she can point out your weaknesses so quick. All you have to do is have an honest conversation where she doesn't feel threatened if she tells you the truth. But uh, you need to know your own weaknesses. You don't need to partner with somebody who has the same strengths and the same weaknesses that you have. That's just, that's redundancy. You don't need redundancy in most situations. Okay, identify the talents, abilities, strengths, or resources that you need in your partner. And then you identify the list. A person who can buy into your vision. That's really important. Now here's where most partnerships, once again, fail. They don't, especially men. Women, it's just the opposite. Men are terrible at assessing the character of somebody they want to partner with. Why? They're blinded by the person's experience, resume, wallet, house, toys, cars, job titles, all those things blind us, and therefore we end up in partnership with someone who has no integrity. That has cost me millions and millions of dollars. Now in America, I'm in a tax bracket where I pay out uh, about 60% of my income in taxes. And so if I put away a million in the bank, I had to earn over two and about 2.2 million to put that million in the bank. Well, I've lost millions because I didn't consider the character. Solomon says that when you partner with a thief, it'll be worse than a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Now think about that. When you have a broken tooth, can you think about anything? other than getting to the dentist quick, man, you are in agonizing pain. Or a foot out of joint, you're not gonna walk anywhere. You are stopped, dead in your tracks. Well, he says that's better than partnering with someone who doesn't have integrity. So that integrity is really important. Look at the willingness and ability to commit. Now, in your max teams, you can partner with a 1,000 people, and that's great. But where you pour your time are the people who are willing to make the right commitment. And it's not that you ignore the others, it's just that the people that want to grow, you're going to serve them, so long as they show up and do what you tell. Just like my son. If my son, oh, by the way, I didn't tell you the other part of the deal with Maria, my son's high jump coach. After she finished giving him all the rules, she looks at me and she says, and now it's your turn. I have rules for you too. I said, okay. 
She said, you will never talk about high jump with your son, never, unless he brings it up. Okay. You will never offer him any advice, even if he wants it. No advice. Do you understand? Yes, Maria. I will fire him if you disobey. Okay. I won't give him any advice. Even if he asks it. Even if he asks it. You will never get up out of your seat at a track meet. You will stay in your seat. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. You will not yell anything until he completes a jump and then you can, then you can cheer. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. So we're at the Junior Olympics that he won. It's raining. The bar starts at 5.9. He clears that easy. Bar goes to 5.11. Now it's really raining hard. First attempt, he turns, and it's a high torque turn. There's a lot of pressure when you make that turn. And as he turns and takes a step, he slips and slides into the mat. So that counts as a miss. And I hear all these coaches behind me, and people whisper, he's done, because high jump's real psychological. And they say, that's it for him. Well, I get out of the chair, and I'm going to start walking toward Maria. And she, she looks at me, and she goes, what are you doing? I said, do you want to get him to do a run through so he gets confidence in his mind? Sit down right now and don't get out of your seat again. And my son, who's quite a ways from her, hears that and he knows nobody, he's never heard anybody talk that way to me before. <laughs> so he starts laughing, right? He's, he, just, he just, that made his day. And, uh, and I sat back in the seat he, oh, she said, he's just fine, was her comment. Well, the next jump, he clears it. Just keeps going up until that final jump when he won it all, see? So she knew what she was doing, I didn't. Okay, are they a positive or negative person? Not positive thinking. I don't like the whole concept of positive thinking. Positive thinking can be someone who is totally unrealistic. And when you're unrealistic, you go in the battle, okay guys, don't worry, there's 10 of us and there's 2,000 of them, we're gonna win this battle. How many bullets does each of you have? Well, we each have a, a magazine of 15 rounds. Let's see, 15 rounds, there's 10 of us, that's 150 rounds, and there's 2,000 enemy. We're gonna have a hard time here. See, I don't wanna be a positive thinker. I wanna be a positive person, and there's huge difference between being a positive person and a negative person. I teach on how to become. Do you know anybody here, no matter how bad your circumstances are, can be a positive person? Do you know the most positive person I've known in my lifetime, in my lifetime, is a man who ran the pin relays in high school, and a year later he was confined to a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis so bad that the only joint that didn't hurt was his jaw must jaw. Every other joint, if it moved, you heard it crack. And you'll see him grimace in pain. You know what he became? He became a preacher at Arizona State University with Campus Crusade for Christ. When he died, 10,000 people whose lives had been changed filled Sun Devil Stadium to honor that man who had spent 30 years of his life in a wheelchair telling college kids how they could have a happy life with God. Is that amazing? Most positive person I know, the only joint that didn't hurt was his jaw and he used it. Never heard Elmer Lappin complain one time. Worked with him for four years at ASU. As a, I was a student. He was the leader, the head of Campus Crusade for Christ at, at Arizona State. Anybody can be positive when you know the way to become positive. What's the key to positiveness? It's not positive thinking. The key is gratitude. A, per, a person who's grateful is positive. What do I have to be grateful for? You don't understand, I lost my job, my wife ran off with my boss. You know, I mean, you can give me a thousand reasons. Oh, I heard every time I wake up, I move. Come on. You want me to tell you what to be grateful for? Can you breathe without pain? Last seven months of my dad's life with lung cancer, every pain was I mean, every breath was painful. Okay, my aunt who died of bone cancer, every time she'd turn on the bed, you'd hear a bone crack. There's pain and there's pain. 
we have so much to be grateful for. You live in a free country. How many of you are afraid that ISIS is going to take you down tonight? How many of you are afraid of being dragged out of a church on Sunday or watching your children being dragged out knowing they're going to be raped or sold into slavery for $15? See, you don't have to worry. We have so much to be grateful for. And the more you're grateful for, the more positive you are. I will tell you, I've had great effective partnerships. My partners at American Telecast were as close, as, as close to me as my immediate family. And they were positive people. Find positive people. A negative person poisons everything. They poison your day, they wreck it. Can they be redeemed? Yes. But don't partner with them. You can be their friend, just don't partner with them. Look at the partner's natural drives and gifts. Avoid theorists. I can't stand people who have theories for everything. Okay? Theorists don't do anything. They teach, usually. And I don't mean teaching at a, at a grade school, high school. I mean Harvard MBAs. That's all theoretical. Wharton MBAs, on the other hand, they come out knowing how to do a financial plan. Wharton is... But, but man, Harvard MBAs, they will give you so many theories for everything, and they won't accomplish that much, usually. I said that in my book, and I heard from Harvard. Okay. All I said was, I'd, if I was going to start a business, I'd rather start one with my German Shepherd than a Harvard MBA, because my <laughs> German Shepherd has good street smarts, common sense, knows who's bad, knows who's good. I said, a Harvard MBA doesn't know any of that. They didn't like it, but it was true. Okay, prioritize and recruit. You have to prioritize your list. And I always say start at the top. If I could partner with anybody, who would that person be? Now, if I can't get that person, who would be number two? Who would be number three? Who would be number four? I never start at number four. You say, well, number four will listen to me. Number one probably won't even take a phone call. Come on. How do you know? Do you know I had tried to get Tom Selleck to do an insurance commercial for me one time. I called his agent, Betty McCart. I said, uh, I have a client, I'm gonna do an insurance program. I said, you've seen Senator Sam Irvin doing that. He's making a lot of money. He's doing that for me. Uh, I named several of the other celebrities that were working for me. And I said, and I'd really like to get Tom Selleck on board. She said, Tom won't do a commercial for, at any price for anybody. She said, he, Pepsi just offered them, this is back in 1984, Pepsi just offered him uh, $10 million for seven seconds of a 30-second spot, and he said no. He will not do a television commercial. I said, well, will you ask him? She said no. He's already made it real clear, and I don't mess with Tom. He's made it real clear he will not do a commercial. Six months later, I had another idea for another commercial, and I called up Benny McCart, and I said, I've got this commercial I'm going to do, and I want Tom Selleck. She said, Steve, I've already told you, Tom will not do a commercial for anybody at any price. Didn't you hear me six months ago? He won't do a television commercial. I said, you don't even know my offer, Betty. Are you telling me that if I have a client that will offer him $106 million to do a commercial, he's going to turn it down? She says, you don't have a client like that. I said, how do you know? You don't even ask. You don't know what the offer is. She says, what's the offer? I said, I want him to do it for free. <laughs> she said, are you crazy? I said, no, but I do read. And last week in TV Guide, I read that he said National Review was his favorite magazine. And I've already got President Reagan, who was president at the time, to agree to do it for free. I've got Moses and Ben-Hur. He's agreed to do it for free, Charlton Heston. She says, you got Chuck Heston? Yeah, and he's doing it for free. And I said, as good as Tom is, he's not better than the President of the United States, and he's certainly not better than Moses or Ben-Hur. <laughs> and she says, well, what, what do you have in mind? I said, it's for National Review, and he said it's his favorite magazine. And I said, I, I, he's, it's only going to be a cameo. Chuck's going to carry the whole thing. It's a two-minute commercial. Chuck's going to be most of it. President Reagan has about an a, a eight-second, 12-second cameo. And Tom would have a little cameo of seven to 10 seconds. She says, oh, OK, I'll ask him. I said, as long as you're asking about that one, I've got a second thing I'm doing. 
And uh, Charlton Heston's agreed to do that, and that's a freebie also. And I told her what that is, and she says, you're just crazy. And I said, well, you just ask him? She says, okay, I'll ask him. She says, I'm calling him in about 20 minutes. She was in Beverly Hills, he's in Hawaii. She um, calls me back about an hour and a half later. Steve, this is Betty McCart, and uh, I have to apologize for being presumptuous. I said, what do you mean? She said, Tom wants to do it. I said, which one? She said, both. <laughs> so I got Tom to do the only two commercials he's ever done, and he did them for me for free. See, he was at the top of my list. He was number one. Why? Because he was the number one television star in America for six years in a row. And women loved him, and I needed women to ring those phones. Okay? So, and President Reagan, that was no, he was the reigning president at the time. No acting reigning president had ever been in a TV commercial for a non-political commercial. And Reagan was going to be the first. For free. Same thing with Chuck Heston. So, we prioritize, we start at the top, we recruit. Now, here's the key. We approach from their frame of reference and benefit, not yours. See, Tom Selleck wasn't doing that for Steve Scott. He didn't even know who I was. But he loved National Review magazine. He'd gone on record, it was his favorite. He loved President Reagan. He really liked Charlton Heston. And the thought of doing something with those three for the magazine that he loved, that he read every single issue from cover to cover. See, his frame of reference, not mine. Same thing with your, so you always, and we'll get into communication tomorrow. The other person's frame of reference, that's key to effective communication. Tomorrow, you're going to learn some communication skill sets that are truly amazing. And I didn't invent one of them. I'm just a good learner. But they changed my life, and they changed the lives of anybody who uses them. So we're going to get in that. Finally, effectively utilize and motivate. When we provide the opportunity, we have to give the authority. And uh, that's another place people make mistakes. Hey, can you do this? Yeah. Well, then we try to micromanage them. We don't give them the authority to really follow through. That's bad. Uh, number two, the right incentives. That's really important. They have to see what they're going to get out of it that they want. You know, people are motivated by different things. But you, you say, well, how am I going to know what they want? Uh, ask questions. Ask questions of people who know them. Ask questions from them. Do your homework. <clears throat> Provide the right environment. I get claustrophobic if I'm in an office with no windows. When Bob Marsh agreed to partner with me in 1976, he first put me in an interior office with no windows. And I said, Bob, I know I'm the junior man on the team, but I can't, man, this is driving me crazy. I, I, I need to see light. He knew that I was going to be the racehorse he was going to bet his whole life on. So he said, you want light? You've got it. I'll switch you out with such and such. So I got an office with a window just because I needed light. He provided the right environment, not only physical environment, but the right environment as far as encouragement, a willingness to listen. There, there's so many things we can do that make it the right environment for our partnership, see? Um, when I had failures, Bob never said, I can't believe you just wasted a half a million dollars of our, our money. I can't believe you just wasted a million. He never did any of that. And tomorrow we'll get into a little bit of how you, the right way to handle people's strikeouts, because this guy was perfect at it. Using the long-term motivation strategy, motivating strategy of honor instead of fear. Most people try to motivate by inducing fear. Do this or else. If you don't do this, then this will happen and everything. That gets short-term quick results, and sometimes that's what you need, but not always. It, it, it can be very damaging to a relationship. But on the other hand, when you use honor to motivate, that builds the relationship. Okay, creative persistence. This is a new subject. Oh my gosh, it's almost 10 o'clock. That means I got four minutes. Is Shannon around? Oh good. Shannon, you're up in four minutes. 
Five tops. Worst case, six. Okay. <laughs> Edison. This is so important. This one skill set is so key that I, I can't, and, and look who invented it, Thomas Edison. All I did is, I, I love to read biographies. I used to, I don't anymore, but I loved Edison's biography as I learned so much from him. Okay, now, persistence, like I said, isn't what people think. It's not hitting the wall again and again and again, and each time getting up and hitting it harder. Now, that's stupidity. Creative persistence, well, first let me go back. Creative persistence is hitting the wall, falling down, and then figuring out a way to get under it, over it, around it, or blow it up, okay? That's creative persistence. And Edison had a technique for that. Okay, number one, he defined his vision in writing. That's why we talked about vision mapping, writing. Now think, if Edison is as smart as he was and he had to write it down, there's a, I guarantee you, there's some smart people in this room, nobody's as smart as Thomas Edison. And he had to write it down. He had to make it simple and visual. You saw the power tonight of the right side of your brain, and you'll learn more about it tomorrow in our communication time. But, uh, but the, he would create that little picture and so on. So define it in, in writing. Number two, broad ramifications. Now this was the key. This is really important. In Edison's journal for the light bulb, he defined the vision in a single page. And I already read you what the paragraph said. It said, create an affordable, long-lasting, incandescent light, and then blah, 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 blah. I can't remember the rest. But that was, that was page one. The next nine pages were the broad ramifications of creating that light bulb. Give you an example. I'll summarize the nine pages. If I create an affordable, long-lasting, safe, and effective light bulb, then everybody in America is gonna want it in their home, their farms, their offices, their factories. Everybody's gonna prefer that over kerosene lights. So I'll sell a lot of light bulbs. And as long as I'm selling a lot of light bulbs, people are gonna need electricity to power it. So I'll provide, I'll generate the electric power and sell power. Do you realize at the time of Edison, nobody in the world was selling electric power? So I'll sell electric power to every factory, farm, home in the United States. If I can do it in the United States, I'll do it in Canada. I'll do it in all of North America, Central America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And as long as I'm getting electricity to every place in the world, I'll come up with other things besides light bulbs that run off, those elect off electricity. And I'll sell those. So, but it took him nine pages to say all that. Nine pages of broad ramifications, why? Because if ever he felt like giving up on that light bulb, all the ramifications go away. I'm not gonna sell electric power. I'm not gonna put electric power in all these homes. They're not gonna want things that run on electricity. I'm not gonna sell any light. All of that goes away. You write out the broad ramifications of succeeding in max. Number one, people's lives are gonna change. There are people that are gonna live longer, live happier, be thrilled with life instead of disgusted with life. There's so many things. I provide an opportunity and all of a sudden somebody, some single mom whose husband ran off with a secretary, some single mom's gonna be able to support her children. She's not gonna to have to take a third job. She's got a shot at, okay? You think of those broad ramifications, and it not just the people I talk to, not just the people I share with, it's the people they share with, and the people they share, and it goes on for generations. My effectiveness in this business can affect the lives in the next five years of thousands of people. That's a broad ramification. Broad ramification of making my marriage succeed. My sons learn the right way to treat a woman. My daughter learns how a husband should be, how a dad should be. I mean, those are just two of the ramifications. Ramifications of not succeeding in my marriage. My boys never learn to see how dad should treat his wife. My daughter doesn't see how a dad should be toward his daughter. 
and on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, some little conflict comes, and you think, I'm out of here. You think, wait a minute. You turn to that broad ramification list. You go, holy mackerel, I can't walk away from that. See, Edison knew that. So we write out the broad ramification. If you haven't done that for your max business yet, do it. Sometime in the next 10 days, two weeks, broad ramifications of succeeding, both in the physical and healthy lives of people. How many of you here have seen at least one miracle from somebody on max? I mean, something that you know, okay, look at all that. Write that down. See, broad ramifications, you won't see any more if you quit. Broad ramifications of putting a little more time and effort into it, more people are going to see miracles. Broad ramifications. That was such a, a cool thing when I saw that. Infect the hearts and minds of others. Edison always infected, besides his staff, he always infected at least five people with his vision. Why? So if he felt like quitting, somebody would say, hey, Tom, we can't quit. You know, you said that if we did this, here would be the out. We can't quit, you gotta keep going. I don't feel, I don't have any more energy, I'm tired. I don't have any more ideas. We've tried 500 filaments. Each time we try one, it takes days to set up. I've tried every filament. It doesn't work, I was wrong. No, Tom, don't give up. Come on, buddy, it's us. See, that was the, that was how he, did it. He infected the hearts and minds of others. Plan, now this is one I wish we had more time, but I got, oh, you know, I'm going to take two more minutes. Um, <clears throat> plan for criticisms, obstacles, and failures. That's part of the plan. You know, the guys that hit the home run strike out more than anybody else because they're swinging for the fence. But that's how they become the home run hitters and get paid literally tens of millions of dollars per season because they hit the home runs, but they know that strikeouts are part of it. You are gonna be criticized. You're gonna have obstacles. You're gonna fail. It's okay, failure never killed anybody unless you're a pilot or a brain surgeon. Where's Paul? Don't fail. The rest of us can fail. Edison not only expected it, he planned for it. He knew because he was doing things that other people said couldn't be done, he was gonna have failure. Now look at this, response and activity. Accept responsibility for your strikeouts. Don't blame other people. Strikeouts aren't a bad thing. The best hitter in baseball his history had two seasons where he hit over 400. Anybody know his name? No? Who said Ted? Yeah, Ted Williams. Do you know, he, after every game, he watched the film of that game of him coming up to bat, he never watched himself get a hit. Not once. You know what he watched? His strikeouts. He wanted to know what he did wrong. He wanted to know what ball the pitcher threw, how he threw it, why he swung and missed three times and ended up striking out. He watched his strikeouts. Strikeouts and failures are our best teachers when we Go back and analyze them and bring in partners to help us analyze. Every time I had a strikeout, Bob Marsh and I, when the pain wore off, would sit down and we would write out, okay, now let's see, what did we do wrong? I'd call a few people. Hey, if you saw this commercial, would you respond? No, why not? Well, because you didn't do this or because it's too high priced or because of this. And I learned from it. And my batting average went from 25% in year one to 50% in year two to 75% in year three. And two days later, come up, Dad, do you know what I could have, what do you think? You know? And maybe they'll never say it, but we correctly learn how. And I do a whole bunch of that in, in my books. I mean, I show you how to do that. Use roadblocks, obstacles, failures as a springboard to develop a creative alternative. Okay, that's somebody telling me besides the Lord, it's time to quit. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the rest of this right now. But maybe tomorrow we'll start out with that before I go to the next subject.